everyone and welcome back to Scandalous Media. It's Angela here and it's been almost one year since Prince Harry and Meghan Markle's insane Netflix reality show, Harry and Meghan premiered. As you guys know, I covered that intensively in my six-part series which I put for you in a playlist. I recapped every episode and exposed all the lies said within the episode. Today's video is something that you guys have been requesting for a while and that is a collection of 10 insane lies Harry and Meghan said throughout their episodes. So get yourself situated, grab yourself a nice snack, and let's get ready to expose some of their insane lies. If you guys want a part 2 to this video with another collection of lies, let me know in the comments down below. Before we start, be sure to like and subscribe for new videos each week, turn on the post notifications so you don't miss the live chat we do for every single video, follow us on our social media where we are posting reels, tiktoks, and inside celebrity tea on our blog scandalous.media, and without further ado, let's get into the video. Lie number 1, The Changing Miscarriage Story, Episode 6 I thought it's best to start it out with one of their major lies told on Netflix, especially in today's climate, where Harry and Meghan are jetting all over the world without their kids. The kids topic has been a controversial topic because many people have theories that Meghan was never pregnant to begin with, or that she used a surrogate, and some even believe that the kids don't exist to begin with. Which is a little extreme in my opinion, but which theory do you guys believe? Or do you believe that Harry and Meghan are just not the best of parents who can't recall a story accurately and like to leave their kids for multiple weeks at a time? There are three versions of the miscarriage story, which makes us think that someone is lying. In the first version given to us by privacy queen Meghan, who chose to write an article for the New York Times in November 2020, she writes that after she got Archie from his crib and after changing his diaper, I felt a sharp cramp. I dropped to the floor with him in my arms, humming a lullaby to keep us both calm. The cheerful tune, a stark contrast to my sense that something was not right. I knew as I clutched my firstborn child that I was losing my second. In the second version, which was in episode 6 of the Netflix soap opera, Megan isn't in Archie's nursery after changing his diaper as she claimed. Oh no, she's actually outside of her home, holding Archie as her friend Abigail drives up so she can give her a tour of the new Santa Barbara home. Megan then tells her she's having a lot of pain and that's when she fell to the ground while holding Archie. So I guess she wasn't singing a lullaby, she was actually giving Abigail a house tour. Abigail is also not mentioned in the article that Megan wrote in November 2020. And in the third version, which is in Spare, Harry writes that to celebrate their new home in Santa Barbara, they had a quiet drink together. And they don't mention a location or anything, he just writes, On our first morning in the new house, she reported abdominal pains and bleeding. Then she collapsed to the floor. I also found it odd that he wrote that they had a drink together if Megan was pregnant. And it's unclear if he was there or Abigail was, but in Spare, he writes as if he was there. Meanwhile, on Netflix, Megan was with Abigail showing her the house, and in the New York Times article, Megan writes she was changing Archie's diaper and humming a lullaby. So, what is the truth? Also, if you guys have been keeping up with my videos over the past couple of months, here is a running list of times Harry and Megan ditched the kids. First, they left the kids when they flew to Germany for the Invictus Games. Then, after Germany, they reportedly went to Portugal for a vacation. Then, they came back to New York for a mental health event where they piggybacked off Project Healthy Minds. After New York, they flew to the Caribbean for another personal vacation. And finally, they were seen landing in Atlanta, rumored to go visit Tyler Perry once again without the kids. And yet Megan spends every moment talking about how the kids are her number one priority, how she wants to make sure she's the best mom, and listen, I'm all for moms taking vacations, girl do you and take care of yourself, but these are young kids that Harry and Megan are leaving for weeks at a time. It's giving boarding school. Line number 2, How They Met, Episode 1 as we all know, and as what was exposed in court, Meghan and Harry gave information to the authors behind Finding Freedom. This is a fact. In Finding Freedom, it was written that they were set up on a blind date at Soho House's Dean Street townhouse, and a source, aka Meghan, described the pair as being in their own little world. Apparently, that first meeting lasted about three hours. 
Scoby and Durant explained that despite the palpable attraction between them, there was no goodbye kiss, no expectation, just a hint that something was there and they hoped to see each other again soon. Now in episode 1, Megan tells this long story of Harry seeing her on a Snapchat video where she was posing with the dog filter because she's just a quirky Megs and there was an exchange of emails of him wanting to meet her and then they say that they met on Instagram and Megan, who doesn't care about status, went through his private feed on Instagram of his pictures of just elephants in Africa and that told her all she needs to know about him. Whatever you say. This was also done to dispute the claims that Megan and her extreme willpower did not in fact Google Harry. I just want to know, does Harry believe that lie? So they switched up their story from meeting through a blind date to meeting on Instagram. The book says they met for drinks on the first date, and so does the episode. However, they told the authors that the drinks lasted three hours, but said in the episode that the date only lasted one hour, with Megan needing to leave fast. Lie number three, implying that Megan was raised by her mother, episode two. Throughout the Netflix soap opera, they try to make it seem like Doria raised Megan. When they visited Megan's old school, Doria said there was a nice network of women who helped raise Megan, but from the age of 9 to college, Megan lived with her father full time. He paid for her private school and college despite her lying and saying she put herself through college. In an effort to make it seem like Doria was present in the picture, Megan says that her parents co-parented well. You mean only Thomas parented? Because Megan even says it herself, she was a daddy's girl. They completely gloss over the fact that her father put her through school and they don't seem to explain the gap where her mother was missing from her childhood for 10 years. In the episode, she mentions graduating from Northwestern University, but not who paid for it. Thomas even sold his Facebook shares to fund her first wedding to Trevor Engelson. Not once did she help pay for his medical fees or anything of the sort though. That's pretty harsh. And this is all proven in court documents, where it's also said that Megan had done nothing to support her father since May 2017, a year before her wedding to Prince Harry. So she had already disowned her father before the wedding drama and the paparazzi stuff. Yet she wanted to give the viewers a biased picture that Doria raised her and lead the viewer to believe that Thomas was a deadbeat. Now this can count as another lie if you ask me. Line number four, those who live in Nottingham Cottage are so short, episode four. Harry and Meghan spent a chunk of the episode trying to convince viewers that they were oppressed by living in Nottingham Cottage because it was so small and the ceilings were short and Harry would hit his head sometimes. But they tried to act like the royal family gave them this short side of the stick treatment by making the spare and his wife live there, when in reality, the future king and queen of England once lived there. Kensington Palace sounds very regal. Of course it does. It says palace in the name. But Nottingham Cottage was so small. As far as people were concerned, we were living at a palace. And we were, in a cottage we on, were a living pa on, on palace, palace ground. ground. You're so brave. And yet Harry claimed that he didn't know who lived at Nottingham Cottage before him, but they must have been short, he said. The whole thing's on a slight, on a slight lean, <laughs> really low ceiling, so I don't know who was there before. They must have been very short. He would just hit his head constantly in that, in that place because he's so tall. Hmm. I didn't know Catherine, who is 5'9", and William, who is 6'3", are considered short. Free real estate in central London and they managed to complain. Take a look at Nottingham Cottage and tell me more about how small it is for two people. What's hilarious is that Prince Harry moved into Nottingham Cottage in 2013 and deemed it his bachelor pad. Did the ceilings not bother him then? Well, Oprah came over for tea, didn't she? She did. And when she came in, she sat down, she goes, no one would ever believe it. No one would ever believe it. <laughs> Why are you the way that you are? Line number five. The royal family cut off Meghan and Harry to force them to come back. Episode six. Harry and Meghan fed Tyler Perry the following narrative, which he repeated for Netflix. Tyler claimed that the royal family did everything that a batterer would do, such as cutting off their funding and their security in order to force them to come back. So not only did he compare the royal family to domestic violence, but he claimed that the royal family cut them off so they can come back. That's not true any way you put it. Actually, it was a well-known fact that Prince Charles, at the time, was still funding Meghan and Harry. His office, Clarence House, published in its annual accounts that Charles paid his sons, Prince William and Prince Harry, and their families a sum of $6.3 million. The annual report covers the period from April 1st, 2020 to March 31st, 2021. 
and it's not broken down by family. Harry previously had told Oprah that his family literally cut me off financially in the first quarter of 2020. He said that he had to use money left to him by his mother, Princess Diana, to help pay for security for his family. That is also a complete lie. A spokesman for Clarence House told the BBC that the Prince of Wales allocated a substantial sum to Harry and Meghan to support them with their transition in stepping down as senior members of the British royal family and relocating to California. So they did not cut them off, and they did not cut them off to force them back. Line number six. Megan spent Christmas 2019 in Canada because of press drama. Episode five. Megan blamed the press for ditching the royal family for Christmas in 2019, but what she failed to mention is that both she and Harry took a six week long sabbatical from royal work shortly before Thanksgiving and then spent Christmas in Canada. Meanwhile, they were actually meeting with people to have a US branch of their charity Sussex Royal, which came after they departed from William and Catherine's charity. So they claimed they needed a mental health break, but really, they were canoodling with Hollywood executives. Line number seven, they were bullied out of the royal family and forced out by unfair treatment, episode five and six. This is an ongoing theme. Why did they leave and who made them leave? At different times, they claimed that the unfair press treatment made them leave as if leaving the country would stop the press coverage. Another lie as we see today. Another story is that William bullied them out, which is also a lie. And another version of the story is that Harry and Meghan said they never wanted to leave and always imagined the kids growing up on palace grounds. All of this is disputed by what they exposed in episode 5, which is they never planned to stay. Their plan to leave was years in the making. They said that in 2018, they planned to live in New Zealand. So this is after the $33 million wedding. Then there was talk of them living in South Africa in 2019, and that was actually finalized and approved by the palace, but then it got scrapped because they claim it was leaked to the press. This is a lie because there are journalists in the US who got a tip from Meghan's camp saying that they were planning to move to Africa because originally Harry wanted to live there and work there like his mother. And many sources say that Meghan played on that part by telling him that when they get married, they will move to Africa which made it seem like Megan is this great woman who doesn't care about the attention. She's willing to live with me in Africa. And that, of course, is a lie. Line number eight, the engagement interview was rehearsed, episode three. Megan opened up episode three, calling the engagement interview an orchestrated reality TV that was rehearsed. She also said that they weren't allowed to tell their story, referencing the engagement interview. And before Harry cuts her off, she says, they didn't want. To which Harry says, we've never been asked our story. Interesting. So they didn't want you to tell it, but at the same time you weren't asked to tell it? Michelle Hussein, who interviewed them in 2017, said, We know recollections may vary on this particular subject, but my recollection is definitely very much asked to do an interview and do said interview. Journalist Emily Andrews says, Interesting observation by Meghan that their engagement interview was orchestrated reality show. I remember Kensington Palace saying Meghan had specifically picked BBC's Michelle Hussein and was very specific on what she would and wouldn't say. As Michelle says, recollections may vary. Line number nine, where the proposal took place, episode two. During their official engagement interview, they said that Harry proposed to Meghan in the kitchen, and then she turned around and found him on one knee in the kitchen. Standard, typical it's night for us. It's a cozy us. night. I was, what were we doing? Just roasting chicken roasting and having... Chicken. <laughs> trying to roast chicken. <laughs> trying to roast a chicken. And it was just, uh, just an amazing surprise. It was so sweet and, and natural and... I think I managed to catch, catch her by surprise as well. So. Yeah. And yet in this episode, they show them in the middle of a walled garden, and Megan's on the phone with a friend recording him, and she says, Jess, Jess, it's finally happening. And then they show us a picture of Harry on one knee in the garden with her dog. So it didn't happen in the kitchen? Also, who records their own proposal? Line number 10, the palace denied her family invites, episode three. In episode three, Megan talks about reconciling with her niece, Ashley, who is the daughter of her estranged sister, Samantha Markle. After the engagement, Ashley says that communication with Megan became less frequent, and that led her to assume that Megan's relationships were managed on some level. 
But obviously that is the lie Megan told her because suddenly Megan is now recruiting her past when there were multiple credible sources who said that Megan dropped her old friends and families when she climbed up the social ladder. And the proof was that they weren't around when she started dating Harry. Then they claimed that Megan's communications team advised her not to invite Ashley because Megan was like, how do we explain that the half-sister isn't invited but the half-sister's daughter is? Simple, you just invite her. Also, it seems like Megan was telling her communications team that she doesn't want Ashley there. The whole thing seems like she just blamed the royal family on why she cut off people from her family. Because as suspected, her entire story was a lie, because a well-placed palace source spoke up and said, It was completely in Meghan's gift as to which members of her friends and family to invite to her wedding. It wasn't a discussion, it was her decision. One source noted the irony that Ashley, who Meghan had sought to shield from the media intrusion, now appears on camera as part of the global Netflix program. Implying that the guest list was messed with just because Meghan only wanted A-listers she never met invited to her wedding before her family is low. Alright guys, well this wrapped up the top 10 lies I collected from Harry and Meghan's soap opera. Let me know if you guys enjoyed this video and if you want me to do a part 2. For a more in-depth discussion about the episodes, be sure to check out my 6 episodes on their 6 episodes and check out my Harry and Meghan playlist for more videos. I hope you guys enjoyed, let me know what you think in the comments down below, like and subscribe for more videos each week, follow us on our social media, and as always, I'll see you next time.